So yesterday we began unhooking a little bit, letting go, looking a little bit what's beyond things that we hold on to or things that we see or things that we feel, stepping backwards. And uh, Bart talked a little bit about the imperceivable and the unknowable, which is a little bit out there, conceptual, when you first hear it. It's, yeah, okay, beyond the final frontier, you know, later. <laughs> but this, when we begin, which we are beginning to look into the layers of form, to show where there are a little bit of a map of what there is, what you can expect to find when you do move beyond holding on to stuff. <coughs> like stations along the way, inside. So the imperceivable is always there. And it's there much more than we could think. If you notice, even now, even in the now, in the here and now, there's a moment where we're there. And then, it's like a blink, and we're gone again, and then we're back again. It's like imperceivable blinking. We're here, totally, then we're gone, and back again. So like microseconds, where we're tuning in to something beyond our perception. As if actually we're constantly checking back, back and in, back and in, back and in, back and in. It's a very natural thing. We all went to sleep last night. We all surrendered into something beyond perception. This is the big blink. <laughs> We're able to easily surrender, even to long for it. And to long for it not just because of the tiredness, the physical tiredness, or the emotional tiredness, or spiritual tiredness. To long for it because it's good. It has a good effect. It, there's something in that which is beyond perception, which rejuvenates us something very much like home. So much so that if we kind of have a night's sleep where we don't quite reach that, mm. but we reach maybe a, a diffuse level of awareness with a lot of dreams, or we don't quite lose our consciousness of the uh, talking mind all night, then we wake up a little bit dissatisfied, a little bit disappointed. I didn't quite make it home last night. <laughs> When in meditation we uh, surrender to that which is totally beyond perception, of course, we don't know what happened there, or what's happening there. But what we can notice is the effect of it when we come back into awareness. There's something good. There's an incredible wisdom arising from there. Uh, a very unconditional support not support in terms of holding, but support in terms of okayness from the guts of ourselves. When we're moving through our lives and we hit something which is not easy, this perceptive blink is often longer. We kind of black out as if consulting, and then we come up again. We're kind of recomposed for what we're about to deal with. You're walking down the street and there's somebody you had an argument with, they're coming towards you. It's very in intuitive, instinctive. There's like this dive into the imperceivable and then you come up recomposed to deal. Like a reset. When we are uh, thinking or composing 
or creating as scientists or artists. You know, a scientist will sit in his laboratory and he's got his problem on the edge of the unknown. I speak about it really practical, the scientist. And he, he's stuck. Everything he's been taught is not going to answer this problem. It's there as a support, but he's stuck. He needs something else. So what he'll do is he kind of surrenders everything he knows, everything he feels about the problem. He kind of goes almost like a prayer, deeply inside, surrenders to something and waits. And often inspiration comes. Try this. Look over here. Maybe like this. <coughs> uh, when we write poetry or paint or come look for creative inspiration, often the most authentic and truthful forms appear when we let go completely and we dive into that. Even if it's just for a moment and then something comes forward, I'm going to paint an owl. Why? It's come from there. So it's very, very worthwhile because it's not far away. It's really part of who we are, of how we... It's our resource which... Maybe religions honor it quite a lot in a religious form, the great unknown, the God Almighty, the surrender to this thing which is so far beyond ourselves. But it's actually not only in a church or in a prayer that this is happening, it's happening moment by moment, like a constant attunement from behind perception itself even. And it gives a clarification of perception. Because when you dive into that, as you come out in the very first seconds, the awareness and the consci consciousness are very pure. We begin to hang again and to pick up, even if it happens very quickly or very slowly in waking up in the mornings. Some people like to wake up slowly. It's, an, it's a purification that happens also of perception itself. You emerge for, even if it's just for a moment, pure and innocent. Uh, free. You emerge totally free. <coughs> it's often called inspiration the results of such a common movement. I need inspiration. But you don't get inspiration by looking around. You can maybe connect the inspiration of another to open your own inspiration. So you mimic their inspiration, and but in a way you're mimicking the same movement. It takes you to that, to a deeper level. A level of freedom, a level behind. So part of the art is to let this be more without permission because we can extend it, we can do it more consciously and with more awareness. We can refrain from immediately hooking onto it all the habitual stuff that we're used to. This is the beginnings of mastery, to stay a little bit more. In a way, the first layer of form is perception itself, consciousness, awareness, and uh, pure existence, continuity of existence. In a way, existence births awareness, which births consciousness. like a pyramid. It's not like existence goes and awareness takes over. There's existence out of which comes awareness, evolves awareness out of which evolves consciousness. 
all three at once, attuned, attuning. <coughs> and then there are these dimensions which we've already talked about, of emptiness, which is very connected with existence. Stillness. Which we can experience quite amazingly when you travel. The body moves, but I don't. It's still the same one, it hasn't moved. The stillness, which everything is happening and the body is moving and it's changing countries and it's in the sky and it's on the ground, but I'm not moving. This is a kind of physical kind of stillness that allows us to travel in these crazy ways across <laughs> the globe. <coughs> and silence. And these are forms, in a way, because they are also changing. Stillness can change its qualities. Silence is what we will be working with today. But there are degrees of refinement and purity of silence. Silence is not the opposite of noise. Quiet is the opposite of noise. The silence is there anyway. Unconditional to any noise, or to any sound, or to any thinking. It's always here. This silence is much more vast than any individual person. Nature is very, very, very strong in its silence. The moon is silent. Outer space, the universe. In a way, noise is quite a precious, tiny happening in a sea of silence. It's so much part of us and so much bigger than us, it can be hard to attune to it. But there's a lot to explore there. Partly why we don't attune to it is because it seems basically nothing, boring. When we begin to allow this <coughs> awesome silence inside ourselves, We can notice it has a particular atmosphere, which is as it is in any moment. It, there can be an angry silence. Our silence can be angry, we can use it like a wall. can be an anxious silence. Our silence of mind in many ways takes on the qualities of what's happening in awareness. 
whether or not we're conscious of it. It can be a loving silence when awareness is free. There can be a sad silence, almost to the extent that silence is sometimes understood as sadness or isolation. And when we begin to sense the flavors of our own silence, and it's not like it's always like that, it's how it is right now, we can also begin to sense where our silence ends and the big silence begins. In a way we begin to blend with something bigger than the individual silence. He knows all about silence. <laughs> oh, you telling them about silence like death, you think I didn't know about silence? <laughs> In some ways, we're so rejecting of uh, the silence, it tells a whole story of where collectively we're, we are limited. You find it very easy to share talk, to talk, even in intimate relationships, the talking. But to share silence is very confronting sometimes. It can be shameful which is kind of bizarre, because why would it be shameful? What can come forward is the push and the pull. So that my silence is pushing your silence on. Who is receiving? So in silence, there's an opportunity to move to a real blend beyond the mind, between people. But in this, there's a fear of intimacy. So silence in the way, like still, or a state of still stillness, a state of meditation, is a form. An empty state of emptiness is also a form. They are doors, doorways. And what Georgie brought forward when we move into silence, and we move into silence together, a bigger silence can come forward. And silence is very much on the level of the mind, on the level of the thoughts. And what happens when we try and move to this bigger silence is a blend. A blend of mind. A little bit, not too much. And what Georgie brought forward, what is created then comes forward is a fear of intimacy. The question is if this 
fear of intimacy, when you look more deeply into it, is this not connected with the fear of losing what you think is the self, your own mind, your own thoughts, the I, the self which is formulated in your thoughts. Silence, like all the other levels, is a door. And it's a very, very small door and a very big door at the same time because silence is everywhere. It's between every thought, between every word. There is a sea of silence with a little bit of noise here and there when you look at universal. And at the same time, it's a very small passage a very small place to sit in. It's your own thoughts, which kind of are formed layer by layer by layer by layer, kind of your own persona. And move into silence, move beyond that, out of your own thoughts. The movement backwards into the unknowable is the movement into the collective mind. The collective intelligence and maybe not even of the humans, but maybe of the universe. Collective consciousness. And this collective consciousness, this collective mind, by some people is called God, or an aspect of God. And that could very well be. It is not that important how you call it. For sure, we are part of creation. And being part of creation, you're also part of the Creator. So, the fear of intimacy so often is connected on all levels with the fear of losing yourself. But then, <clears throat> if we look at all the form which is inside us, our body, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our qualities, everything, every moment which is created as an experience in our lives. All of this, when we look to it, what we do with our precious eye is all the time kind of interfere with this interfere with whatever is moving forward as form. This thought is right, this thought is not right, this I want to have it like this, I should think this, it should be like that. This emotion is not allowed right now. This feeling is not allowed right now. This should be there. It's like we are busy, busy, busy recreating or undoing what is And so we kind of, you know, are struggling with whatever form there is. And struggling in whatever, with whatever form there is gets us very deeply entangled in form. We lose ourselves in it. We hardly know anymore what or who we are with our precious I. But we hardly know what the I is. We hardly are able to contain and oversee what we are, who we are. The same is physically, you know, change a little bit this, change a little bit that, nose job, make my brows some more nice, pluck, pluck my chin, 
wipe my ass. That is a good idea, but <laughs> <laughs> but we're all the time we're also busy with the physical appearance, clothing, and of course when you look what's behind it is something which is really, really kind of crazy in a way. So, if we realize that on the other side of silence, maybe what's called the unknowable, but what we dissolve in, in moments that we are not in the I, is in the collective, the shared. Maybe unknowable because it's uncontainable. But when we move into it in sleep, in meditation, when we dissolve, it feels so home. When we dissolve into unity, it feels so home, so right. More home as <coughs> the little I which is formed, which is separate. And in all of us there is this very, very deep longing, this very deep longing for this unity, coming home. We long for it in our relationships, in our friendships, give me a bit of unity. So it's also a conflict between keeping our I and moving into unity. So yesterday, what Georgie brought forward in one of her talks, is if we are able to let go of form, form by itself will be recreated, more refined, more precise, less interfered with. Basically, in the seven-year education uh, in healing, one of the <coughs> most important things what we learned is that things are healing themselves. The moment we don't interfere, we, we can are able to let go. We're able to release the conflict which is around something. It starts to heal itself. So, the moment we stop identifying with a form and can accept a form as it is, it's not you, it's just what's there right now, a form. You are not your illness. The illness coming forward is taking place, is <coughs> we're suffering by the symptoms of the body or the mind trying to heal whatever is going on. An illness itself has no symptoms. The symptoms we see in the illness is, are coming forward from trying the body to rebalance, to heal. It's the interaction between a virus and a body, a bacteria and a body, or the bo a part of the body fighting itself. It's the conflict, which gives the symptoms and us overcoming the conflict, trying to overcome the conflict as well. So the more we sit on the conflict, the more we hold on to the conflict, the more we absorb into form, in how it has to be, but the less we are often able to restore, to move back to the form it originally was, or the form which has to be, the real form, 
I give a lot of words and none of the words are really right. That's the difficulty. So let go of any form, the form by itself will be reborn. Letting go of the precious I we have, the I will be reborn. Letting go of your thoughts, even letting go of the ability to think, it will be reborn. It will be recreated in a much purer form. And much more attuned to the whole. Much more part of the whole because it will be reborn through the unknowable through the collective, through the need of the universe, whatever you call it, through what is behind everything. So if we talk about silence, then silence basically is this little small place which is immense, endless, universal, at the same time. But at the same time, this little small place between the collective and the individual. It's where the collective and the individual are touching each other through silence. Where we become aware that many, many of our thoughts are not individual. They just come and go. It's something expressing itself through us in thoughts. And now and then we can pick up some thoughts, and we can build a train by ourselves, by analyzing something. But most of the thoughts, they just come and go. So it's interesting to look at that, because if you really look at thoughts, it's like there is a system of computers. They all link together. Internet. And all these computers are used for something, a big job, much bigger as each single computer. But still, each single computer can focus on that little tiny job it does for itself. And is adding in this to the big job at the same time. So when you look to your mind and your thoughts, you see that it works a little bit like this. There's a lot of thoughts in our mind which just kind of move through associations, you don't even know where they're coming from. They're part of a story, but we can only see a little bit of this story. They're not really even coming from us. We don't start them. You recognize what I'm talking about? This becomes especially clear when we fall asleep. It's not about all about us. There is something shared there. So when we fall asleep, <coughs> We don't mind to dissolve in the collective. It's relaxing, it feels okay. Also, when we wake up and you look on the level of thoughts, so in the first waking up, there's a memory of the dreams, partly which were there, of the whole kind of sometimes activity of the mind which has been there as well, like a used computer. 
and then kind of you know you move into a realization of your own mind your own thoughts it's kind of like ah what I'm going to do today what's happening where is my coffee <laughs> whatever it is the first thought it's raining whatever is the first thought something wakes up a space in yourself wakes up which is connected with the individual life the I so the movement from the I into the unknowable and back into the I is a movement we make very very much and in between there's always this moment of silence it doesn't work without silence Silence is giving this expansion. So, Eckhart Tolle, when he talks about consciousness and uh, moving into silent stillness connected with consciousness, what he says is at the other side there is this incredible intelligence which is there for all of us which is the background for all of us to understand things, to oversee things so often when we are asking ourselves a question and we are able to let go of the question I don't know the unknowable that's often what's happening after a while and sometimes immediately an answer will come forward an answer as what we call an inspiration or an inner knowing or intuition So where is this answer coming from? Is this the chip on our shoulder or the angel who's talking in our left ear? Or could it be that this answer is maybe be coming from the collective? The collective mind we all tapped in. The unity on the level of consciousness, which is there always on the background the big witness the consciousness which is always witnessing and we have a little drop of witness inside ourselves like a little drop of thinking inside ourselves, a little separate form of being part in the end of the whole. So the frightening thing, again I'm talking in circles, but the frightening thing in moving in silence and moving beyond silence is to let go of the form we call the I. But again it's an idea that we're afraid of it because we let go of it every night we let go of it a lot of moments during the day when we move into you, I don't know when we move into the unknowable when we move into silence in silence there is no I there is not something like private silence okay you want to take a so in meditation <coughs> 
if we find we're drawn in that direction of or bothered by busy mind, by thinking. Busy mind is an experience, it's not quietening, it's like almost like a swarm of bees or school children in a classroom. The moment we just bring out awareness actually, it's like to that, this is happening. It's almost like uh, the teacher came into the classroom and all the children that were like <laughs> suddenly election. It's amazing how busy mind doesn't like to be watched. It continues a little bit. Two little <coughs> kids continue chatting here and there, but there's a kind of hushing just by our being there also aware of it. And then It becomes interesting because when you really look at where, or inquire, you become curious, where is this thinking coming from? What is this thinking? What is thought? I'm thinking, but how? How's that is happening? Which we kind of get used to and ignore, but it's happening, this thinking, which is kind of a miracle in itself. And what can be seen is that this busy stuff tends to be just cause and effect, action, reaction, replaying, which is less interesting. <coughs> but when we begin to attune to the silence and allow the silence beneath that, which is anyway there, regardless of the uh, action replays going on above, we can really begin with some curiosity to experience thought as it emerges. And this is a different kind of thought. It's not a busy th thought. <coughs> At first, it's formless. It's not in words. Something is moving through the silence. It's almost like a layer of understanding, a movement of understanding. And you can feel it moving before it expresses in words. Sometimes it doesn't need to express in words. You can have a whole understanding and you don't actually know what you understood. You just step behind and because you are there, it happens by itself. Like much of our understanding is unconscious. And sometimes it comes very precisely with a verbal form. And then there's a peacefulness because it's done. It's not like thinking in itself is to be avoided, it's to be cherished, but we cherish it all the way. Really look at where this miracle of thought is coming from. What's the question? <coughs> What's emerging out of the silence? What's behind that? Where's it coming from? This can be quite a beautiful way if we find ourselves caught in the mind, to go all the way, to really look at the miracle of it. Often what we will discover is that the roots of this understanding is wisdom, a very deep wisdom which is not personal, <coughs> but the understanding is, because the understanding is bringing it into form, a form which is relevant to us at this moment. <coughs> and it's very important not to move with rejection, not to move with rejection of th thinking or thoughts, or, because in a way, everything that is appearing is there to serve us to serve us in our way, in our evolution, to serve us in a way of making us more free, free to move through form, which includes the mind. And of course, when we move into this, Let's look at the miracle of thought. It's amazing how much silence there is and the thought's not there. <laughs> <You know? coughs> 
and the silence we thought was out of reach is suddenly the main thing. But it does begin at a certain stage to tell, and thinking starts up from a depth. And of course, the more we become conscious of silence, it's so in a way, the light of consciousness has an effect also on silence. Its flavors begin to change, or things become revealed, which is very releasing. And it's very supported by a backdrop of peace. This peace, eternal peace, in our perception, in our consciousness, it's bringing peace. And in a way, the silence is part of this peace, in its purity. It can be an angry silence, or a separate silence, or a uh, troubled silence, a silence in pain, with pain in it, with suffering in it, but it's supported by this peace. It's almost like silence is made of little grains, little particles, which is all the time changing, evolving, moving. It's actually not the dense vibration and thought, the fast one. It's the other way around, <coughs> a very, very fine vibration in silence. It's like a shortcut to getting to the point of what to think. Just by allowing it to be there and really allowing ourselves to enjoy, celebrate the silence, which is anyway there. Not just between every thought, it's there at the same time as the thinking. yet <laughs> but it's very much in through and uh, behind and above and before and after thinking silence basically always there without silence no sound could have a form if you think about it if you reflect on it music, speaking, thinking, it all gets its form by silence. It's vibration, which is divided by silence, the space between words, the space between tones, which is also vibration. <coughs> 